Turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 23, and, and when we read this especially, if, if you're not familiar with this passage, it may seem like an odd passage of Scripture from which to read and, and then to consider the entirety of the law, but this is actually uh, where I want to come to a conclusion. And uh, uh, maybe one day I'll do a study just on Leviticus 23 because, and, and look more in depth uh, at this particular passage, but this is more of a jumping off point more than anything else. But Le Leviticus chapter 23, we're going to be begin reading in verse 4. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, it is, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread of the, to the Lord. For seven days you shall, you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a, to a holy convocation, you shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation, you shall not do any ordinary work. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into me, excuse me, when you come into the land that I uh, give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of its first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the green offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen." And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or, or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of, uh, of, your, of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations and when you reap the harvest of your land, you, reap, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Okay, so let's just pause and make sure we see what we've just read. Beginning of verse 4, it speaks of the Passover. Then beginning in verse 6, we see the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Beginning in verse 9, that's the Feast of first fruits. Beginning with verse 15, it speaks of the Feast of Pentecost, or also known as the Feast of Weeks. And then beginning in verse 23, it's the Feast of Trumpets. And all of those have corresponding events or situations in the New Testament. We're not going to t do that study tonight. Uh, that'd be a whole different study. It'd be for an another time. But, uh, but we've been looking at the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch is it called, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these five books together compose what is commonly called the law. Now, when, when you speak biblically of the law, uh, you, you, you may speak of it in, in a variety of different ways because you, the, the law may be referring to the Ten Commandments in different places or the law may be the whole body of all of the statutes of Scripture. The law uh, may refer to all the writings of Moses or 
the, 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 the law may be the entire Old Testament, which usually when that's the case, it's referred to as the law and the prophets. Uh, the law may also be all the ordinances of God in both the Old and New Testaments. But for our purposes tonight, when you hear me refer to the law, I want us to understand, to make sure we're all on the same page here, that I want you to understand the phrase the law for us tonight will mean the law of Moses in the Pentateuch, the first five books from Genesis through Deuteronomy. And I want us, want us to consider it from several different angles. And what we're going to do is this. We're, we're going to take, uh, take it as a, a, as a sort of uh, many-faceted jewel. And we'll just simply turn it first one way, then another. And, uh, and, and uh, so that often what's going to happen, you're going to be hearing the same thing or something very similar, just turn sideways and then again and again and again. And, and then we'll allow the prismatic effect of the light of the Holy Spirit shining through these truths to show us the different variations of color and ideas and that sort of thing. So as we begin to look at the books themselves, the Pentateuch may be divided between the, you can, there's a natural dividing place between the first two books and the other three. You have Genesis, which mean, meaning beginning, and you have Exodus, meaning departure. And if you look at just these two great books of Moses, you see them as the story of the beginning and the story of the exit, the story of the birth and the story of death and departure. These books begin with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis ends with a coffin in Egypt. Therefore, it begins with both the birth and creation story and then through death and into the departure from Egypt uh, which is the symbol of death. And you, you might also say that Genesis is about the creation of the world and Exodus is, uh, is about the redemption of the world. Now, take, take all five books together. Genesis is about the creation of human history. Exodus is about a people redeemed in human history. Leviticus is about a priesthood for worship out of that people. Numbers is about the people provided for in the wilderness, the church of God in the wilderness, so to speak. And Deuteronomy is about the law. In fact, one might uh, say it is the second statement of the law because the very phrase Deuteronomy means second law. And it, it, so you have the creation of human history, a people redeemed, a people of priesthood, a people provided for in the wilderness and the law of the people or, the, or a people of the book. So you have the creation of God, the redemption of God, the priesthood of God, the people of God, the law of God, or, or, or the word of God. Now, let me just share with you a few things about some of these books before we dive in in more detail. The, the words that we use for the titles of these books, and just hang with me because I know this is an unusual way to start, but, but hang with me. But the words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuter Deuteronomy, all of them except for one are actually translations, Genesis meaning beginning, Exodus meaning escape. Le Leviticus has to do with the priestly order of the Levites. That's why it starts with Levi, Leviticus. And then Deuteronomy, which actually means the second law or twice written, uh, which is, is from a Hebrew word that means words. And the, the Greek translation of that means the second law. And, then you, and you'll notice when I said those, I skipped over the book of Numbers. Uh, because Numbers is differently named. It's, numbers is actually an English word, uh, the, the, the title that, that's been given for, uh, for a concept. The Greek word that is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is arithmeo. Arithmeo, actually, the emphasis is on the A. And, and that's the word from which we get our word arithmetic. Therefore, these books might be called the book of origins, the book of escaping, the book of the priesthood, the book of arithmetic, and the book of the law. Now, why is arithmeo used? It has, it has one of two meanings. Uh, the, the, there are two numberings in the bo book of Numbers. One is where all the uh, tribes of Israel are numbered. They're, they're listed. There's, there's a census is done, and that was done twice once before, right before Mount Sinai, and, and then nearly 40 years later in the, on the, in, the, in the plains of Moab for another generation. But it also may mean the numbering of the people as an idea, as a concept, as, as in, as in uh, who is numbered among the people of God, the concept of a, of a number before God and um, uh, people called into his presence. Now, having said that about the books as an introduction, let's just talk about the books as ideas or concepts. This is going to lead us a little bit more into what we're going to be talking about tonight. We see 
these five great church themes in these books. We see creation, redemption, worship, congregation, excuse me, and sanctification. Well, let's go through that again. Genesis, obviously creation. Exodus, redemption, because they're brought out of slavery in Egypt. Leviticus is about worship. We'll get into more about that in a few minutes. Numbers is about the congregation, the church, the number of God's people. And then Deuteronomy deals with sanctification, the law, restatement, restating of the law. So creation, redemption, worship, congregation, and sanctification. Now, re remember those ideas, and then let's turn the jewel yet another time. And now we move beyond the idea of the corporate concepts of the law and look at, look at the Pentateuch as it relates to the individual believer. So you can see all of these themes are very, very similar. That's why I say we're just turning the jewel a little bit, and it's a little bit different uh, perspective of the same idea, the same concept. So Genesis now, when we talk about individually, Genesis is about my birth and my sin, where I come from and why I live the way that I live. Why, why do I begin full of potential and end up in a coffin in Egypt. Exodus is about salvation, the delivering hand of God, getting out of bondage, getting out of Egypt. Leviticus is, is about my need for worship. In Leviticus, the entire book is about worship, and I, and I find that there is a need in me. There, there's a need in humanity. Human beings will always worship something. Either they will worship the, the true and the living God, or they'll worship a stone that they have carved into their own image, or they'll worship a picture of a chicken or, you know, I mean, India, there's a place where they worship, worship, uh, you know, a, a golden monkey. I'm just thinking of all the things you're going to worship. A monkey's got to be the worst. I've been to the zoos. They throw nasty stuff. I mean, I'm not gonna, I just don't want to bow down before that, you know, but, but, but people are going to worship something. And numbers is about my struggling in the flesh to meet the demands of holiness. Deuteronomy is about a second promise of rest. Now, stay with me here. Uh, Genesis, birth and sin. Exodus, salvation or deliverance. Leviticus, the life of worship and prayer. Numbers, struggling in the flesh. Con the law constantly demanding higher and higher levels of obedience and my inability in myself to meet its demands. And then Deuteronomy, the law speaks to me yet again, the promise of rest. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. And... Uh, and, and uh, I want to talk to you musically speaking. I love music. I've had some training in music, uh, but musically speaking, a musical phrase typically re re resolves at the end. What, what does it mean to resolve? If a passage of music doesn't resolve at the end, what happens is you have this sort of kind of a breathless, empty, funny feeling, you know, it's, it, it, and let me just show you what I'm talking about, a couple of things. Uh, go ahead uh, and, and play that first song with me, for me. The song. We all love Amazing Grace. Now listen to this as he plays it. you feel that? <laughs> There's something in you that's like, uh, it didn't quite finish. It, doesn't, it didn't resolve to itself. It's, it's, it's kind of this feel like you're walking along and all of a sudden you just freeze because it's like it just didn't work. Let, let me play one more for you. Play the second song. Doesn't that almost hurt? <laughs> you know, you just want the song to finish and resolve. And, but, but listen, here's the reason I say all that and the reason I play that is because when you come to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, you have exactly that same feeling. I, I've given you all of these ideas and concepts, but what you have is a people who have been created by God. They've sinned against God. They've been delivered by God. They've been called out by God to a life of worship. I mean, what, what, did, what does Moses say to Pharaoh? What's the first thing Moses said to Pharaoh? 
He said, let my people go that they may go into the wilderness and what? Escape Egypt? No, uh, that's not what he says. That's what they do, but that's not what he said. He said, let my people go that they may go into the wilderness and what? Somebody said it already. Worship God. A people delivered by God in order to live a life of worship in holiness before the law of holiness, before the God of holiness, and they fail miserably. There, there is a second statement of the law and a promise, re, a promise of rest in the promised land, which is to be inherited by the people. And, and, and that promise is given. And now all of a sudden, Deuteronomy ends, it just comes to an end. They're not in the promised land. They haven't, they haven't received the rest that he's talked about. And, and it, it, it's as, as if you want to say, well, what now? What now? We have no resolution. Moses himself gives us the same feeling. I, I know this is a, it was a funny, you know, kind of a boring way to, to start this, but I needed these themes before you in order for you to understand this juxtaposition against the life of Moses. But Moses' life is divided into three different, uh, three different categories, 40 years in Egypt, then 40 years in, in Midian, in the backside of the desert, and then 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So when you, when you come to the end of all of that, his years, 120 years, Moses, he's there at the end of his days. He's poised on the very brink of the promised land. Everything that he has lived for, it's a fulfillment of, the, of his destiny. And he goes up on top of Mount, Mount Nebo, and God says, there it is. And Moses says, great. And then God says, that's all, Moses. You know, and Moses dies in the, and is buried by the hand of God there in Mount Nebo, just poised, just looking over, beholding the promise, but not receiving it. You, you just have this breathless sense that the whole story is just not resolved. You, 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 you come to the end of the law of Moses, the five books of the Pentateuch, and you have this same funny, empty, odd unresolved feeling that you have from the life of Moses itself. This means that there, there must be a resolution to it, but here's the thing, it is, the resolution is not found in the Pentateuch. For the resolution of the Pentateuch, you must read Joshua. To find the rest that they were promised, you have to go on to Joshua, or you, as you might say it in Hebrew, Yeshua. The name Joshua is, is, I don't know if you know this, is the exact same name from which we get the English transliteration that we say Jesus. It's the same Jewish name. Now stay with me. A people made by God who fall into sin, they're in the slave bondage of Egypt, redeemed by the hand of God, called into a life of worship in failure and despair over the inability of the flesh, condemned by the law, and yet knowing that there is a promised rest somewhere out there. And where is the resolution? In Yeshua, in the book of Joshua, or you could say, if you used our modern uh, uh, pronunciation, the book of Jesus, which follows the first five books of Moses, which, and, and, and that's where you find the resolution of the great promise. And I'm telling you, that is really something because you begin to realize there's a picture. Everything about Scripture is intentional. God did not choose or put anything in there accidentally. It is no accident that the promise that is rest for Israel is they're led into it by a man named Yeshua. It's all a picture there. The, the book of Joshua is the fulfillment of the prophecy, yet he is also a prophecy of more to come. He, he leads them into the promised land, which is but a shadow of the promised land to come. There, there is a promised rest to the believer. Now, we, we've always said that. We've always believe that and we've even sing, sung songs about it but sometimes we just forget what we believe you know one of the great old hymns of charles wesley is a song called love divine in our old hymn books that uh, i grew up with uh, in uh, assemblies of god uh, it was song number three in the book and uh, when when i looked up this song in the in the old hymnal that i had i found out that they actually they changed one of the words from the way charles wesley originally wrote it i i don't know why they did but they did I'll point it out when we get there, but here are the lyrics to the song. Love divine, all love's excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. What, what does that mean? Tabernacle with us. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. All thy faithful mercies crown. All thy faithful mercies crown. In other words, he's saying complete the work. 
Complete the work. All the mercies that you've shown us as, as the church in the wilderness, complete the work. He goes on, Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. What's salvation? That, that final, full, complete rest. Now look at verse 2. Here's where they changed the word. Breathe, O oh, breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find that second rest. Now for some reason, many hymnals change the word second to perfect or promise. That, but that's not what Charles Wesley actually wrote. He wrote, let us find that second rest. I don't know why the edit editors were bothered by second rest, but the whole point of it is that there is a second rest for the believer, uh, that, that I may be brought out of Egypt, that I may be delivered from the bondage of sin, but there is another rest beyond that moment of salvation. Uh, there, 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 somehow or another, wandering, meandering in the wilderness, condemned by the law, there's some kind of second rest, something that is beyond all of this. He finishes by saying, take away our bent to sinning. In other words, don't just forgive me of my sins, but change my heart. He says, Alpha and Omega B. He's the Alpha, the beginning, Genesis. He's the, also Omega, the, the last revelation. In the faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty so, so that we're not driven, possessed, owned, de demolished, demoralized, defeated, and discouraged by the law. But there is that finished work which gives me rest in Canaan. Another great old hymn of the church, many of you have heard, Rock of Ages. Listen to this. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide thy, myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath. That's get me out of Egypt. And make me pure. That's me, get me into the promised land. We see then that in the entire concept and scope and sweep of the first five books of the, of the Bible, five great themes. Man made by God. Man sinning against God. Man called to communion with God. The law from God. And the grace of God. Now in the book of Romans, we also see all five of these themes. And I just want to go through a few of these Ideas so we can see how the concept is carried forward in the New Testament. So turn to the book of Romans and you, you, you can see the entire movement and sweep of the great ideas of the Pentateuch. So Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 18, which by the way, you know, we, we did a long uh, 40 some odd week study of the book of Romans. It's all on our website, not on the video, but it is on the audio. And if you want to check that out. It's there, but so we're not going to do an in-depth study of this of these verses, but I want to tie them in so that we can see these great themes that are found in both places. So we find that the that the message of the Bible is consistent all the way from the very beginning to the very end. But Romans chapter one, beginning in verse 18, we're going to read through verse 32, but uh, it's here first we see creation and the judgment of God against sin. In, in the beginning, God created, but but when people sin, as they do in the book of Genesis, they end up in a coffin in Egypt. So we see this in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. Let's read it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, I'm not going to teach on it tonight, but there's a huge, huge message in this chapter about the wrath of God and what that means, because we tend to think wrath of God is earthquakes and tornadoes and, you know, fire from the sky or whatever it might be. But we will learn from Romans chapter one that the wrath of God is fulfilled in our day, uh, at, at least for the time being. There will be a, another time of the wrath of God. But, but for now, it is fulfilled when God says, when we sin, when he finally reaches that point where he says, fine, you can have it. And the wrath of God is poured out when he steps back and does nothing. And he allows us to suffer the consequences of our sin. But anyway, look at verse 19. For, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in your heart of hearts, you know it. 
That's what he's saying. Every time you look into the variegated leaf of an African violet, you know that this is no accident. Every time a baby is born, you know deep in your heart of hearts, this child did not descend from some primordial, primordial ape grandparent, although there are some children that will make you question that, uh, that we've seen. But anyway, let's keep reading. So they are without excuse. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. This is the wrath of God being poured out when we continue to say, I don't want God. I want the things that he's created. I refuse to recognize and honor God. I'm going to choose to honor myself and, and uh, these, these created things. Then God says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. <laughs> that one always kind of cracks me up that that's in this list. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Here it is. This is death. This is the coffin in Egypt. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. So here we see the story of the Pentateuch. From the creation through sin to a coffin in Egypt, to death. Then we see in Romans 3, we see our deliverance from the slavery of sin by God. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. You know, in a way you could say that as we cross the Red Sea of, of Jesus' blood to get out of the coffin of Egypt. Uh, this was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over, does that sound familiar? Passed over? He had passed over former sins. Is this not our Passover? Is, is this not the blood on the doorpost for us? Sure, it is. Verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. But what kind of law? But by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So now we see that we are created by God. We fall into sin and we must be saved by God. We we cannot do it. There's not in a, work that we, a work that we can do. And then third, we are called to a life of worship. The, the third great theme of the law. Turn to Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Very well known passage of scripture for many of us. It says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So prayer ministry before the altar of incense in the tabernacle, just as we've been studying. We, we're called to a life of communion, fellowship with God, and worship. So we see the first theme, creation, sin, and death. We see the second theme, salvation, a means of escape through the blood of Jesus Christ. We see the third theme, a life of worship, 
and prayer according to the book of Leviticus. And the fourth is numbers, the people. The question for this one is, who is numbered among the people of God? Who is, who is numbered as the people of God? Turn to Romans 10, 4, uh, uh, 4 through 13. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, get this, to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. The whole picture of numbers in the Pentateuch has changed here in the book of Romans. In the, in the books of the Pentateuch, it's those who are numbered of, of the tribes of Israel that came into Egypt and were led out of Egypt. However, in the book of Romans, it's whosoever will. In the book of, books of the Pentateuch, it's constantly dealing with those who are the descendants of the seed of Abraham. However, in the book of Romans, it's an open way before God through faith and, and not through the law. Okay, so now let's keep reading as we, as we have this in our mind. Verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ or Savior down or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone, there it is again, everyone, not just the children of Israel, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Now, you know, many in the modern American charismatic and Pentecostal community, and many who came are in denominations that come from a, from a holiness tradition, it's easy to forget this, this verse of Scripture because it's easy for us to begin to set ourselves aside and say, well, look, I'm holy, the rest of the world isn't, and, and begin to become proud the way the Jewish people did. But did, friends, do not be tempted to go back under the law. Do not be tempted to eat at the old altar. Do not be tempted to, by the old tabernacle. There is no difference between Jew and Jew and Greek before the propitiation made by our high priest Jesus through the new sacrifice of the new covenant of his own blood. There, there is a new numbering of the people of Israel. And it's not of the tribes of Dan and Issachar and Zebulon and Naphtali and all of those, but it's a numbering of whosoever will. Whosoever will. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches, riches on all who call on him. For here's it again. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The new people of God, the church in the wilderness. But what about the promised rest? Where do we find that? What about Deuteronomy? Is there still a rest to come? Well, look at chapter 12 of Romans. Verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Then now verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That's an interesting phrase there because we already, we're already saved. But that means that there is a second rest. That salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. The promised land, he's saying, is right there. It's in sight. It's across the river. We're, we can see it. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, for the flesh to gratify its desires. Then uh, chapter 15, verse 13, may the God of hope, hope is about something that is yet to come, not something that we have. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In other words, there is a promise to those of us who have been right through those steps. 
Now, I want, I want to show you something. I want to read back the first two verses. By the way, I'm not going to go through them, but it's, I think I believe that if, if with any book, particularly books of the Bible, but if you look at the first sentence of a book and the last sentence of the book, very often you will learn the great themes of that book. And it'll, it'll give you a great place to begin looking. That, but look at the first two verses of Deuteronomy. I want you to see something. It says this, These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan, in the wilderness, in the, in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. And I have no idea how to say any of those. That's just my best guess. But look at verse 2. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now, if you don't know anything about Middle Eastern geography, the entirety of those two verses are just completely lost to you. But it says this, it, it, that, that Moses says to the people of Israel that uh, as they are encamped on the edge of the, of the Jordan River, looking across toward Jericho after 40 years of wandering from a place that is 11 days journey away. It took them 40 years to make a journey of 11 days because they're walking in the flesh. They're, 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 they were out of Egypt, but they were gradually dying. D delivered from the taskmaster of Egypt, but now defeated by the taskmaster law. I know I am made by God. I know that I have sinned against God. I know that my life was sealed into a coffin in Egypt. I know that I was redeemed by the Savior. I know that He led me into the wilderness, but it's taken me 40 years to take a journey that ought to, ought to have taken 11 days. Something is wrong. I, I labor in the flesh before the law and the resolution that ought to come uh, at, at the end of the refrain is not there. Somehow or another, I still can't, can't find the way. It must have something, says the book of Romans, to do with the Holy Spirit. Now let's move really quickly and look at the law itself. And we're going to come back to the Holy Spirit in a moment. The law itself, again referring to the first five books of the Bible. What is the comprehensive ideas of the law itself? Well, there are four. Worship, justice, morality, and separation. I'll say them again. All, all of the writings of the first five books of the Bible are about worship, justice, morality, and separation. Under the topic of worship, there are descriptions of the priesthood sacrifices, feasts, and, and, and the tabernacle. And we, and we see that these are all met fully in Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, no longer after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is our feast. Jesus is the tabernacle, as we learned last week. There, there, there are also descriptions of spiritual worship and interesting things. They were told so many details that maybe don't mean as much to us, but we're told how to make the oil of incense. And we're told that there, there are not to be any steps going up to the altar, which seems so odd to us, but, but it, it really makes sense. There's a reason behind it. The priest wore these loose garments, a robe, and if there were steps going up to the altar, then as he lifted his leg, he would pull the robe up and, and, it, and, and it could potentially uh, uh, show his leg. It showed bare legs that might be revealed to people as he goes higher and higher up the steps. And, and the point is that the sacrifice cannot have anything to do with human flesh. So it says it should be a gradually ascending ramp to, of earth to go up to the altar. There to be no steps going up. And we also know we're told, for example, that, that, they're, that, that they were forbidden to have strange fire. You know, pure oil of incense, uh, which we're told is not to be applied to flesh at all. No steps going up the altar so that no flesh is revealed and no strange fire. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but there are only two historical events recorded in the book of Leviticus. Everything else is just straight law. But there are two events that are recorded. Listen to what those two historical incidences are. The first one is the death of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. And the second is the stoning of the death, uh, stone, excuse me, the stoning to death of Shilamith's son for blasphemy. Now, Nadab and Abihu are struck dead by God because they light strange fire on the altar of God. It's worship that is man-made and in the flesh. Shilamith, Shilamith's uh, son is stoned to death for blasphemy, worship that is 
shallow, superficial, self-serving, and filled with a curse and not a blessing. So what do we learn then in the law about worship? We learn that worship is about truth. We learn that worship is about spirit. What's the opposite of truth and spirit? If worship is not in truth and spirit, how is it offered? What's the opposite of truth? Somebody tell me. Lies. Lies. Yes. It's falsehood or lie or deception. What's the opposite of spirit? Flesh. So Jesus says in John 4 to the woman at the well, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So if worship is not done in spirit and truth, then that means it's done in flesh and in deceit. It, it, or, or it's done in a way that's not real. Therefore, we are admonished in the law that all true worship must be about spirit. It must be about truth. It cannot be about flesh. It cannot be about deceit. You, you can't play games with God in worship and, try to, and expect to get away with it. You can't be about generating flesh in the flesh for the flesh. You can't mix the oil of incense, which the Bible says made such a sweet perfume that the people of Israel were tempted to put the perfume that was designed for God on their own bodies in order to make themselves smell sweet. That's stolen worship. This is a sweet smell that's intended for God that now I'm using for my own benefit. However, the word of God in the book of Exodus says that if anyone uses the oil of anointing on himself just, just for his own purposes, he's to be cut off from the people of God entirely. That's what it says, entirely cut off. Therefore, the law is about worship in spirit, not flesh-driven, not flesh-oriented, not flesh-motivated, not for the glory of flesh. Um, and, 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 and I'm not going to try to define what that all means. But, and then worship is about truth, not about deceit, not about making people feel good, not about trying to worship in a way to make everybody else see how holy you are because now you're applying the oil to your own flesh again, aren't you? You're making worship about you. But it has to be worship in reality. Now, now I'll just say, that's the greatest amount of time I'm going to spend on any of those themes, but here's the next one. We have worship, then we see justice, both criminal and civil. You know, we have, in America, we become a nation uh, that's about law and not about justice. Lawsuits are not about justice. Really, they aren't. The, the one reason that people get frustrated and hurt and wounded in American, the American jurisprudence system, it's because they think they're, they think they're going to get justice. Uh, well, they're, they're probably not going to get justice, but they're going to get the law. So now what you hope to do is you hope to win at law, but if you go into it with the benighted, naive idea that you're going to get justice, you're probably going to be disappointed and disillusioned. It's not usually about justice. It's about the law. And what you have to do, therefore, is use the law to beat the law. However, when you talk about the books of the Pentateuch in the Bible, uh, the books of the Pentateuch are about the justice of God. And justice is about teaching people how to do what's right in criminal and civil matters. Then you, you have the, the, mor the morality uh, portion, the, the moral teachings about things. And what are they, what are the, it entails things like you know, lying and stealing and bribery, sexual immorality, all of these things, the moral teachings are to avoid confusion in relationships. And we're living in a land that is saturated with confusion. There are all kinds of perversions and wickedness and confusion. It's simply because people are living outside the moral law of God. So you have the laws of worship, the laws of justice, the laws of morality, and then you have the laws of separation. And laws of separation taught about separating yourself from things that are unclean in God's sight. They had to do with things like touching dead bodies and, and dietary laws and not eating unclean food and not being with unclean people, you know, not touching Gentiles, things like that. Now then, having said all of that, what was the law about? Well, first, the law was to teach us about our sin. It's a teacher. The law shows people that they've sinned. You remember the old, I don't know why I've got so many songs in here tonight, but you remember the old hymn of the church starts off, I think the song is at Calvary, but it starts off, it says, Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Remember that song? The law teaches me that I sinned. I didn't care before, but now I realize. 
There's another line that says, when I saw the cross, I trembled in fear. I trembled in fear. Why? Because I suddenly realized that's my cross. I saw my sin. It teaches me my sin. The law also teaches me the absolute holiness of God. Think about it this way. If, if, if these are simply the dietary and moral and civil and criminal and relational laws of God, then what must God himself be like? I mean, what unapproachable, unimaginable, immeasurable holiness of God himself. The third thing is that the law reminds Christians under the new covenant to rejoice in our deliverance from the bondage of ceremonial law. Every time you read the books of the Pentateuch, every time you read all the lines and the precepts and every jot and every tittle, and after every one of those, you can stop and close your eyes and say, thank you, God, for the resolution of the refrain. Thank you, God, that you, that you didn't leave us stranded in the wilderness. Thank you, God, that we're not standing and staring across from the top of Mount Nebo into a promised land of rest under the lash of the law. So I see in the law my own sin. I see the holiness of God. I see the great glorious deliverance from the bondage of ceremonial law through Jesus himself. Now, having said that, we're ready to deal with the resolution of the issue. Because we still haven't played that final chord. Here it is. What about the law? Jesus said he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He's the resolution. He's the promised land. He's, he's the, the Canaan rest. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's our deliverance. He is our priest. He is our sacrifice. But what about the law? I mean, am I now free to sin? I mean, if Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, then, then what about when it says you shall not commit adultery? Does that mean I can say, thank God Jesus has come. Now I can commit adultery all I want to. It says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Does that mean it's okay now because I'm a Christian, because Jesus has fulfilled the law? Well, what does Romans 6, 1 say? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, he's, he's talking about every time I commit adultery, we're told in previous verses, every time I sin, I receive the grace of God. So the more times I commit adultery, the more grace I get. That was the reasoning behind some of the people, what was going on. And so he says, what shall I sin then? Shall I can say then? Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is exactly what Paul said in response to this question. I like the, like the way the modern English version translates it. It says, God forbid. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that we who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? People that are baptized in water are lowered beneath the waters of death. And during the time that they're under the water, it's, it's as if they were dead. They, they can't exist for long in that unfamiliar and antagonistic atmosphere of water. They can't breathe there. Now, <laughs> we have full hope and expectation that whoever is doing the baptism will lift them up again. But the fact of the matter is, while they're under, they're dead. Then they're raised up. Verse 4, therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of, of the Father, even so we also should what? We also should what? Go on to in sin that grace may abound? No, that we also should walk in newness of life. Therefore, what I long for is the fulfillment of the law somehow within me. If I declare myself to be an outlaw, if I say that's enough of the law, I won't obey the law, I'm out from underneath the law of Moses, and I'm, I'm an outlaw, and I'll just live any old way I choose. If I say that, then the law will fall on me and crush me to a powder. If I determine that I am under the law, that is to say I'm going to obey the law. Now listen to this. Go under the law if you want to, but if I go under the law, I must obey all of it. Everything, not just certain parts, all of it. You know, I mean, here's, here's one of the great ways you can detect a cult. Uh, cults will find tiny little parts of the law or even major parts of the law, and they'll interpret it a certain way, and they'll enforce adherence to the laws and dictates of that cult, and they'll teach loyalty to the cult by obeying their law. 
if you don't, you know, if you don't worship this way, if you don't eat this kind of food, if you eat that kind of food, if you go there, if you go here, if you don't do it this way, you're, you're, you're going to get out of fellowship and you're, you're going to miss God and you know, all this stuff. If you don't do it exactly the way we say you should do it, you know, or they'll say, if you leave this church, if you leave this group, you're leaving God. Um, the, the cult says you have to do it our way, obey our law. They'll always use some tiny, some tiny little phrase or concept out of the law and they'll just beat you to death with the law. You know, whether it's you have to worship on this day, you have to worship like this, you can't eat this, you have to eat that. But here's the thing. Jesus has broken the bondage of the law. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, who are Jewish Christians who have been converted. They found the deliverance of Christ from the law. And they have been set free. And now there are certain people, Judaizers, who are coming to them and they're telling them, that they ought to go back under the bondage of the law. And they're telling them that the Gentiles in their midst who have been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they have to submit to the law of Moses. That is, that is that the men need to be circumcised and they need to begin obeying the dietary laws, those sort of things. And what's the crazy thing is that the Christians in the church of Galatia are beginning to do just that. So Paul writes to them in Galatians chapter 3, and he says this, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I actually really like the way J.B. Phillips translates this, because he, this is what he says. He says, Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. I just love that. I love that. Because listen, when, when the apostle writes to you and he says, Dear idiot, you know that the man of God is ticked, right? But he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, dear idiots of Galatia. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. He said, the truths of Christ have been made plain to you. Verse 2, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, he's saying to them, what started in the Spirit cannot be finished in the flesh. And if you try to finish it in the flesh, you're going to wander for 40 years on what should be an 11 day journey because you're trying to work it out on your own. He says, dear idiots of Galatia, what made you think that having begun in, this, in the spirit, you can complete the work in the flesh? If you try to complete the commands and the dictates of the law in the flesh, you will plug along for 40 years, cruel, wandering, fruitless, impotent, powerless years, and then you will find at the end of the 40 years, you've still gone, only gone 11 days journey. I don't, I don't want to live like that. Lord, I, I, don't, I don't want to die like that. For too many years, I lived that way. As a young man, I, I received Christ as my Savior, and I, I put my shoulder to the wheel, and I put my nose to the grindstone and said, now I'm going to be a Christian if it kills me. The only problem was it liked to have killed me. Years later, I was, the law was just lashing me. After years of fruitless living and discouraged, defeated, in despair, I found myself far from God. Why? Because I had no rest. I had this deep unresolved conflict. I knew that I was a Christian, but I just kept plugging it out for years in the flesh until I found myself far from God and hopeless and in despair, saying to myself, there has to be something more. There has to be something more. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, you come to the same conclusion. There has to be something more. Okay, we're out of Egypt. So what? Well, God says, all right, here's, there's, here's, there's Mount Sinai, here's the law. And we say, well, thanks, thanks for nothing. Now I'm condemned. The law condemns me. It teaches me that you're holy and I'm a sinner. Shows me my own fruitlessness before the law. Okay, well, here's the promised land. All right, I'm ready to go in. What do I have to do? Tell me what I should do. Yeshua will lead you in. Yeshua will lead you in. You know, Moses came and went. Joshua came and went. David came and went. Priest, 
prince and king alike, generation after generation after generation, the years and their cycles came and went until the prophet Jeremiah in the 31st chapter of his book said this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. He's saying, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's going to be different than the one I made with Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. Even though I made the covenant, they broke the command, but I was still there. I was still faithful to them. Verse 31, excuse me, verse 33. For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God says, I will make a new covenant and I will no longer write the laws on the ta on ta tables of stone, but I will write the law on their hearts. So I cannot be an outlaw because the law will destroy. I cannot be an in-law because the law has no power to save me. However, if the law is in me, if the law is in me, if that law is inward, as a spiritual principle, a heart circumcision, as John Wesley would have put it, so that I find myself in love with the God of the law. One of the Pharisees came to Jesus and asked, what's the greatest of all commandments? In essence, he's saying, teach me about the law. And Jesus said, here's the law. Love God and love, your, love, love people. And the man's heart just melted and he said, you know, you know that, that just has the ring of truth. I, I think you're right. And Jesus, Jesus said, of, of course I'm right. I'm God. You, you think I'm just making this stuff up? No, he didn't really say that. What he did say was, you're very near to the kingdom. So the law then is not really about obedience. It's about love. It's about love. If, if I love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength, delivered from Egypt, washed in the blood of a new sacrifice, in a covenant relationship with Him that leads me into worship, how can I get that law written on, on, on my heart? If, on, if it's on tables of stone, they'll fall on my head and kill me. If I try to obey it, I'll, I'll fall on it and, I'll, and it'll break me. So how do I get it from there to here? Now listen to this. Here it is. The Holy Spirit in the book of Exodus is called the finger of God. And we're told that it was the finger of God that wrote the law on the tablets of stone. Nearly a thousand years later, Jeremiah the prophet said, the finger of God will no longer write the law on tablets of stone, but in your heart. So when you say, come, Holy Spirit, fill me, sanctify me. When you say, come, Holy Spirit, and write the law on my innermost being. We, we, we come to the end of the line of notes and I still have that empty feeling. What then is a re resolution? It is to say, oh God, take my life, take everything, take my heart, take my mind, take my soul. I give you all my strength. I love you with everything in me. I love you, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit write in me. You shall not commit adultery and whoosh. Holiness that comes from within. The Spirit takes up residence. The one who writes the law, He's in there. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And we say, God, write that in my heart. And He says, holiness. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. And we don't need it written in black and white. We don't need it on tablets of stone anymore because we hear the voice of the Spirit of God living inside of us, telling us this is what, the, what God wants. This is the way to go. This is not the way to go. And, 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 and listen, if you, lest someone say to you, well, God told me that I could commit adultery. I heard the voice of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will never contradict what He has already said in the Word of God. It will always be consistent with the Word of God. But the difference is no longer am I trying to take a law and bring it from the outside in, but it's the Holy Spirit putting it inside of me and the law and the law of God and the work of God and the morality of God and all of the things that He's trying to do to make me holy works its way from the inside out. The finger of God writes truth, purity, morality, and worship. Worship that's about truth and about spirit and not about flesh. So that a sanctified man in love with a holy God 
reaches across uh, the table of the presence and receives bread and wine from the hand of his high priest, this very same Jesus. The resolution is that the rest begins when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. But the good news is there is an even greater rest coming. That as we continue to follow him, we continue to walk with him, continue to commune with him, continue to walk through these great things and let him do his work. That when this is all said and done, whether I exit this world through the grave or whether Jesus returns to take me home, take the church home, there is a day of rest coming. The ultimate rest. Where no longer will I have to worry about it. I can't, I can't wait for that day when I'm not even going to have to worry about my sin anymore. Because I will be changed. And I'll be like Jesus. And no longer will I battle with my flesh. What a day of rest that's going to be. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for this great gospel, this new covenant that you've given to us that no longer do we have to try to, to find the law and conform to it and, and try to carry out every cere ceremony of the law. But God, that you, you take up residence within us and we can hear your voice. And not only do we hear you, but you empower us to walk in your ways. And Lord, I pray that, that as we walk through this world, we'd realize that there is a greater rest that's coming, that we have received this salvation, we receive this rest with the presence of God inside of us, but there is a greater day that's coming. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to live in such a way that we would be lights shining in the darkness because there is so much confusion in this world, so much darkness, and God, I pray you'd help us to be lights in this dark world because there are people that are looking for that rest. They're looking for answers. They're, they're worshiping all the wrong things. And God, I pray you'd help us to have compassion, that we'd learn to speak the truth in love, and that Jesus would be seen in us. Lord, walk with us and help us to walk with you as we wander th through the wilderness of this world, knowing that their day, the day is coming when we'll have rest with you in Canaan. And we give you praise in the Strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.